<laughs> oh, yes, we are here. Yes, yes, we are here. We're like two seconds early. <laughs> welcome to in class number 64. Yes. Class number 64, welcome. And I just want to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening all over the globe. And, and thank you. Good morning. I'm going to temporarily rock these uh, glasses that Kareem gave me from Ghana, from a company called Boten, B-O-H-T-E-N. Oh. I'll drop a link. And uh, they're for the glare. I, I had LASIK surgery, so I don't need them for vision. Oh. But for the computer strain, I think my left eye is jumping a lot because I'm spending way too much time in front of the computer. But let me say thank you to Kareem. And uh, we're going to be doing some things with these. I love the look. It's beautiful. Wow. They are beautiful. They really hook you up. They got a little tent to them. Yeah, well, you know, it's that Blu-ray. Uh, okay. The, I think, the, the thing that I shouldn't be looking at. I see uh, the enhanced natural bronze of your face. I see the little, uh, little, little little shade there. You know, black look good and everything. But those, those glass, Kareem, good looking, bro. Thank you. Thank the the, the Ghanaian uh, connection, global. Yeah. <laughs> Which, you know, is interesting. I know we're going to have a conversation today about remembering and Memorial Day and, you know, connecting at all the Black Wall Street. But I was driving around this morning and I was thinking about my entry point to knowledge because a lot of mm. people are feeling like, how come I didn't learn all of this stuff in school? And I can't believe I didn't know this. And I feel so bad. And I'm in a certain age and I didn't know this. And I, it took me back um, when I was in college, my freshman year. I spent a lot of time with the international students. Um, just naturally, I don't know even how that happened, but I ended up with the crowd. I was uh, dating this guy from uh, Northern Africa named Musa, and one of my best buddies, uh, his name is Brian from South Africa. It was Tito oh, wow. from the Philippines, my brother Cleopara, who was a Nigerian from yes. more, and and my best friend was Jill from from Bermuda. So that summer. I spent in Bermuda with her and hanging out with her family. And uh, there was another level of opulence uh, that I didn't know existed, you know, and I'm, you know, you got a noon tea and the scones and the country clubs. And all. So I'm hanging out with her family. And one of her uncles is like the island's like best doctor. Mm. And his name is Dr. Simmons. And he's asking me about Drew. And he said, oh, Drew University, is that named after Charles Drew? And I was like, uh, yeah, yeah. And Jill's looking at me like, you don't know. You don't know. Yeah. This, yeah. Is, this is Drew in Jersey, not Charles Drew Medical Center out in California. I went to Drew in Jersey and I had no idea who the hell Charles Drew was. And so I'm, you know, I'm BSing, but he's looking at me like I'm crazy. And Jill's looking at me like I'm crazy. And I was embarrassed. And she was like, you know, Charles Drew, the blood plasma. And I was like, oh, yeah. And I didn't know. So when I got back home, this was before we had the internet. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, you know, I, I made sure I immersed myself and I would never be caught, you know, naked like that again. But it was clear to me that there was a gap in my education. There were things I didn't know. And at 18, I thought I knew everything. So it was, you like know, every something. 18 year old on the planet. Yes. And so, so, you know, for people who are feeling some ways, you know, first of all, welcome, uh, give yourself a break. Uh, you are miseducated on purpose. It, there's no knock on you. There's nothing wrong with you. And this is why we do what we do. And I just want to shout out the team and narrative because I was talking to them this morning and I'm like, okay, we have a section called the archives, which we're building. Again, this is the Pyramid at Giza. This is the Alexandria Library. We are building it one brick at a time. And we already have a collection of people and that part is free. And we're going to put Charles Drew in there. So nobody else will be ignorant mm -hmm. about Charles Drew. And of course, mm -hmm. we have on the other side of narrative, a you should know section. These are more obscure people. You know, like Howard Thurman, like Anna Hedgeman or Anna Arnold Hedgeman and, and S.C. Robeson, who you and I have talked about. And this week, we're uh, unveiling the great uh, Hubert Harrison. So I just want to let you know what's in narrative. And thank you, Dr. Carr, for the time and the effort that you put in. To no, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hunter. And not only thank you for, for this, thank you for reorienting. Because, again, we've been now over a year. But it really started to catch fire right around now after George Floyd was killed. And in that week between his death and when Donald Trump went out there and hold, held that Bible upside down and reminded us that this isn't a nation of one people, but it's a constant battleground between those who believe in our common humanity and those determined to stop it. Uh, Shout out. And we don't have to say it anymore this morning to uh, Mitch McConnell and all the uh, people in the G Republican Party who said, no, we can't investigate because then we all going to jail so we know what y'all doing and, and we're not and see some of us aren't appealing to you we understand 
what it is and what we need to do with you and about you. But anyway, it really and took I, and Let me just say, you and I had a conversation, which will be, a, again, exclusively a narrative because um, after we had the conversation, I was like, I can't put this out publicly. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have to be, you know, and it's funny because one of the ones that we're teeing up, of course, is not just people, because some of these names people have heard. But the question becomes, how much do we know? So uh, the conversation we had about George Floyd and Black Wall Street, oh, and your take on it and what you yeah. said about it. Yeah. Um, needed, to be. Which is why we need places where we can have certain kind of conversations is a certain kind of conversation that will drop on the anniversary of Black Wall Street on Monday. I might do it early. I might put it out on Sunday in narrative. So sign up. Uh, narrative.com. Uh, and then, of course, we did the John Brown discussion, which that's, right. again, that's what that's what I was going to say. John right. Brown. All right. And, and pull that up. Yes. Uh, every time Dr. Carr says, let's be clear. Oh, we're, we're going to drink, we're gonna drink some tea. Some tea, <laughs> some tea or some coffee. Oh, Lord. In that case, I'm going to be full of coffee and tea. <laughs> what are we over? Yes. Yes, indeed. No, but that, that John Brown conversation was so important. And I can't wait for that one for you all to really dig into that because we did a deep dive into John Brown uh, from before he was born until after he died. And, you know, if you want to know what an ally looks like, then go to John Brown. But we won't even say nothing about that because that's on the narrative side. Say less. <laughs> yes, we we'll say less. Exactly right. And, and Charles Drew, you know, I'm wondering, as you say that about Dr. Simmons, did he go to did he by any chance go to medical school in the United States? I don't know. I was yeah. so, you know, when you're yeah. you're so caught up in your experience at that time. Oh, you were so young, of course. You wouldn't have even I thought that. Curious. I was not curious. I didn't ask any damn questions. <laughs> and then I was so embarrassed that I just wanted to leave. You know, no, that's, what, 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 you know, embarrass me <laughs> asking you know, me questions. You you convene the global majority every day, and that includes today, and that includes on narrative. So there is quite possibly, in fact, maybe even likely among those of the fam who are watching and participating from the Caribbean. And we, I mean, every week the chat lights up, but this week in particular, let's remember and let's get in this chat about what we're going to talk about today because I expect everybody's got a tie. But if there's somebody from the Caribbean uh, who might know Dr. Simmons, you know, there, a great number of those medical doctors uh, during and after the independence movement in the Caribbean in the 19. 40s, 50s, 60s, including several of the eventual prime ministers, uh, probably the most famous of which is um, Eric Williams, who went to Oxford, but who actually for 11 years was on the faculty of an HBCU in the United States, Howard University. Um, but many of those doctors, many of those doctors were trained in the United States at HBCUs. They were trained at Meharry Medical College. They were trained at Howard University. And so it quite, it, 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 it I would think it's probably, if, if yeah. not likely, he he may have known Charles Drew because he was in that fraternity. Right, I was gonna say the fact that this man is not American, well, and that was the other embarrassment. Like, but he's, but he's black. about Black America than I do. Well, because he's part of, because he, you, us, all of us are part of the governance structure, who are Africans to each other. So while someone else might mention Jonas Salk in the social structure, to the black doctor who very who may have been trained at a black school, Charles Drew is much more important. Charles Drew, the son of working class parents. Charles, Charlie Drew's daddy laid carpet for a living. Charles Drew born in Washington, D.C. Charles Drew, who was a star athlete all the way up to and through high school. He, of course, went to, if he was in D.C., Dunbar High School, which, you know, M Street High School, Dunbar High School, went off to Aunt you know what? The ancestors are funny. I had pulled this for something else. No way. This is a book called uh, uh, Charles. The, book, the books on Charles Drew, there are a number of them. They're children's okay. books. I got okay. a bunch of them. But this one, this one is one that many people may have not seen. Even if you've seen One Blood, which is one of the books on Charles Drew, which kind of demystifies the idea that Charles Drew because, died because he didn't get a blood transplant. In fact, I've been past the place near Raleigh. Shout out to the folks at St. Aug out there, uh, Raleigh and Raleigh, uh, Shaw University. Because that's near, I, I seen the hospital, the ruins of the hospital where Jack Johnson died. Because remember, he turned his car over too. Charlie Drew went to sleep at the wheel in New or in New or New uh, uh, in North Carolina, and he passed away because of the injuries, not because of blood transfusion. But this goes before that. Charles Drew was a star athlete up to and through when he was in college. He went to college at Amherst College. This is a very rare book called Black Men of Amherst. Harold 
Wade Jr. This was written during the tumultuous black power movement time. In fact, here's how Ray, Wade right here. <laughs> in that first generation of Negroes that busted up in the Ivy League in the late 60s and scared the hell out of white boys at Cornell and all them other places. This was published in 1976. He dedicates it, of course, to my mother. And he's got a chapter in here. He doesn't deal with, um, he doesn't talk about these brothers as individuals. He talks, of, see, Amherst was letting in black men as far back as Edward Jones and Robert Purvis. It goes back to the abolitionist movement. By the 1890s, you got William Lewis, George Forbes, W.T.S. Jackson. And in the earlier 20th century, you got Charles Hamilton Houston. He don't even get up to Charles Drew. In fact, let me go here to the table of contents because Montague Cobb, who we are going to put in the You Should Know, C-O-B-B, y'all write that name down because Montague Cobb, that brother right there is somebody everybody should know. Charles Richard Drew, he gets into, oh man, he ran varsity track and football at Amherst College, all this kind of stuff. But here's the point, I'm gonna get because this is not a Charles Drew conversation today. It's just, but but since you mentioned Dr. Simmons, Charlie Drew tore his knee up in undergrad. He was not a star student. He was good, but he wasn't. He didn't fulfill his potential. Charles Drew expected he was gonna be an athlete and be the man in athletics, in football in particular. Charlie Drew tore up his knee. One of his professors is like, Drew, let me tell you something. You're a great athlete, but if you were to get serious in the classroom, you could make a different kind of contribution. And that's when Charles Drew, Drew knuckled down on the sciences. If Charles Drew hadn't torn his knee up, we might not even know <laughs> Charles Drew as a doctor, as a man who did not invent blood plasma, who did not invent the blood bank, but who brought that knowledge to bear, did graduate work on how to bank blood, extending that knowledge, had to go to McGill University in Canada because he couldn't go to school in the United States for his medical degree in part. Howard, where he wanted to go to school in his hometown, said, hey, look, we're looking at your transcript and you didn't take this English class. So I don't know if we can admit you. Boy, shout out to them Negro colleges still <laughs> creating educational malpractice. That's what sent Drew in part to Canada in the first place. <laughs> uh, somebody, a registrar is like, ah, Drew, you didn't take this. Uh, but anyway, he came back was the chief of surgery, the chief surgeon at Freedman's Hospital and trained generations, generations, including the great LaSalle, LaFall, LaSalle, LaSalle, LaFall, who uh, just made transition a couple of years ago, who uh, was the first black president of the American Cancer Association, trained most of the black surgeons in the country and also trained many black surgeons who, went, who were from continental Africa, from the Caribbean. I suspect Dr. Simmons may have been one of those cats. And if he wasn't trained at the hand of Charlie Drew, he was trained at the hand of the students of Charles Drew, which include Dr. LaFall. Of course, Dr. LaFall, one of his last students, in fact, when he was very close to him, is the current president of Howard University, Wayne Frederick, whose mama said, I don't know about the United States, but uh, there's one school that I know about because our prime minister came from there, Howard. So you can go to Howard because I think they'll take care of you. You got sickle cell. I get people got to look out for you. And that's how Wayne Frederick ended up at Howard, trained by LaSalle LaFall, who was trained by Charles Drew. LaFall was in the last class taught by Charles Drew in 1940 before falling asleep at the wheel because he had students in his car who could not afford the train passage to Tuskegee, this conference they were going to. Drew said, I can afford it. Y'all can't. I can take the train. Y'all can't. You know what? I, you know what? I'll do my rounds. I'll give this talk tonight. We'll get in the car. We'll drive overnight. We'll get there. Drew fell asleep at the wheel in North Carolina. And that's when he entered the legends, movement and memory of African people. But I suspect Dr. Simmons might have known Charles Drew because of that small governance structure fraternity. So, hey, we all know him now. But anyway, that Charles Drew, that's for free. We, that's a footnote. We're going back to the that, that, ladies and gentlemen, is what a breadcrumb uh, will bear. A whole ass meal. Woo! That's what got in the car. All right. So uh, <laughs> what were we supposed to talk about today? Oh, and Memorial Day. And all yeah, uh, this weekend is Memorial Day weekend. And I was like, what does that mean to black people? Mm. And how do we? Why do we celebrate? Do we celebrate it? Because I went back in the annals. I was like, oh, we didn't really deal with this last year. No. Because mm -mm. we were just getting started. And for those of you who have not yet joined the narrative side, please do that. Uh, because we did a long conversation on Tulsa. I pulled a lot of the books um, in this in this year since we've talked about it. Uh, There've been some other stuff, some other stuff come out. So I didn't go back and get all that stuff. You can see that in narrative. And, and so you want to go walk through that. We did a we did a, almost what they call in, in the law and other places a tick tock. In other words, a day by day, moment by moment, what happened between June the 1st, 1921. And, and what, what was really powerful, because, you know, the question was like, what happened afterwards? And in narrative, you talk about how they rebuilt. 
something that I didn't know. I didn't know the depth of it. So we got into that as well. We're not going to do it here. You right. do it here. That's uh, right. Yeah, so, but, but, but in the context of today, and this is where, again, and in, in fact, let me just say this at the onset, everyone who is watching, we want every week you to participate, not just, uh, well, part of participating is listening. And I can't stress how important that is to listen. I spend most of my time, particularly around elders, listening. It may not look like it on Saturdays, but I'm listening all, virtually all of the time. If I can be in a room in the corner listening, taking notes, that's what I do. And so that's participation. It's, it's probably the most important form. But we also want, if you're in the chat, to really get into this topic by helping to share and so that we can become aware when we haven't been aware of the rituals of memory that you observe. And as we're talking, there are going to be some people, I promise you, whose minds are going to be activated and sparked around this question of memory. So let's talk about that. Um, let's talk about that. Uh, we can start with a, wet, with a wet paper, which is what I got this morning. I don't never, <laughs> I don't never complain. I don't call customer service because I understand that I understand, number one, that calls going to a call center somewhere, probably halfway around the world, and that person's not getting paid a lot. I also understand, number two, that the people who are reaping all the profits from these companies aren't the ones who are going to suffer. The ones who are going to suffer are these Amazon drivers, for example. And I try not to use Amazon a lot. If it's something I need immediately, I, you know. But part of the reason it's so immediate is because you got people in here who will put down package delivered because they supposed to have everything out of their car by midnight and you got you didn't load them with too many packages. So I know sometime between midnight and sunrise, the package is going to be out there, but they had to put in deliver it because in part, you know, y'all working the hell out of them and they can't move that fast, which is why I know that's why Amazon y'all made them start taking pictures of it. And some people immediately pick up the phone. When I get a wet paper, I'm very, very careful and cautious. I don't, I don't like to call customer service and report wet papers because I'm going to tell you, I was a paper boy. <laughs> you understand me and my brother Jeff in Nashville. In fact, my daddy was, you know, he picked up a paper route. And so the three of us would be, in fact, I was running the paper route. I, my daddy would give me a uh, load me down with papers. I asked for this little ritual. There was a couple of streets in Nashville where I would literally stay in shape, running down the pa running down the street, throwing the papers into the joint while my father and brother were on the other side of the thing going down in the station wagon. Right. But I remember that I was doing that in 1977. I mean, I was 12 years old when uh, Elvis Presley died on the toilet in Memphis. I remember that because when I got back in the car, it was on the news. Like, damn, Elvis is dead. OK, what's the next street? Social structure. <laughs> who is Elvis to uh, them? <laughs> governance structure. Who is Elvis to us? As in the words of the great Carlton Rittenhauer, Chuck D. Elvis <laughs> was a hero the most. <laughs> but anyway, I'll let y'all finish the rest of that lyric. Mm. I was a paper boy. So I know that paper women and men now very different than when I was throwing papers in the late 70s. Meaning that somebody complain about a wet paper, that's going to come out of they $3.00. Or they two dollars. So I'm very careful. So the paper is over there drying on a mount on, on, on one of the bookshelves that y'all can't see. You know, <laughs> you, can see the, you can see the fraction, but you know, just you can't imagine. And I that's all right because everybody's been in my house now for a year and it's cool, but I'm just saying you've been but it's they're drying over there. The financial times, New York Times, you know, watch the post, everything's drying over there. But the reason I subscribe to the physical paper with my little salary is because that's a ritual and it's a ritual that reminds me of my father it reminds me not only of being a paper boy it reminds me of reading papers from as as, as early as i can remember because my daddy read the paper since i was an infant before i was an infant it reminds me of crawling around on the floor with the paper not even being able to read it it reminds me of the stories my mama tells about you know at some point i got up and said what's this word and she told me and i went back down like i was reading i don't even think i was reading i don't remember that but she does movement and memory in other words the physical paper in my hand and some of y'all like that it's like your coffee or your tea it's a ritual so rituals are important but not just as individuals so when somebody interrupt your ritual it can it can mess up your whole day so i'm saying i'm not gonna put these uh working class people these folk we folk delivering this paper on blast so I'm going to try to dry the paper out when we get off of here. And I got two or three other things to do before I got something to do this evening. Uh, the paper will be dry. No harm, no foul.
go with God, just please y'all make sure y'all wrap up the paper because I don't because mm, mm, you're going to mess up my day. Then Professor Hunter came in with all the energy in the world and reframe me. I'm perfect because the rituals are not just individuals. The rituals are collective. Rituals are what enforce and reinforce our memory. Where you start a ritual reinforces how you think about yourself in the present. When you do those rituals with other other fight, other folks, you got people who read the paper together every day or once a week. They read the Sunday paper, husband and wife, family, whatever. You got people who eat meals together. Well, guess what? As we think about these Memorial Day sales that are showering on us now, coming across our computer screens, our cell phones and on television and everything else for Monday. Uh, these these Memorial Day sales that are absolutely anchored in the social structure, you know, who are people in the United States to business. These social, these categories, these African states categories apply to all human beings in different contexts. That's why they're so very useful. But with us, the question of Memorial Day in the United States, for those of you who are not in the uh, in the United States, Memorial Day is a, uh, a ritual holiday in the United States, a federal holiday, which means it's it's one of the on the official federal calendar, which means uh, most people get that day off if they're at work, um, except those people like Amazon, paper boys and girls, knife kind of thing, women, women and men. But that is a day set aside um, the uh, first Monday. Uh, I guess this is the first Monday in June. It will be to uh, to commemorate, to memorialize, to reflect on and remember the sacrifice of those who lost their lives in military conflict and combat in the American military. Now that immediately creates a conflict and a tension that is at the heart of the so-called American nation, because contrary to what uh, Tim Scott and, and Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and Cory Booker and whoever else says, there is no we, the ancestor Elijah Cummings, there is no we. He said, we are better than that. No, we're not better than this because there's no we. What we you talking about? <laughs> so, but for the context of how, quote unquote, we, meaning those who are familiar with the concept of Memorial Day in the American context, the U.S. context, think about it. Memorial Day is a day that we set aside to reflect on the sacrifice of our honored dead. Okay. Well, what does that mean? What does that mean when you start thinking about sacrifice? particularly blood sacrifice. Because if you're talking about people who were wounded in conflict and combat, if you're talking about people who lost their lives as a result of violence that is uh, comes out of con combat, conflict, and war, then that we is much larger than the American military. That we includes all of the Africans who lost their lives in Tulsa, Oklahoma on June the 1st, 1921, because they were in combat. They were part of a military, an involuntary military. They were drafted into a military that did not represent a nation. They were drafted into a military when other Africans who looked like them uh, set upon them, captured them and delivered them to other Africans and then Europeans who had been the reason why the first African put their hands on them in the first place and stuffed them into boats and sent them over here. That was a declaration of war. Ira Berlin, an interesting little book called The Long Emancipation, talks about the idea that what you're calling the enslavement, it's really a war. It's really a war. And, you know, except there was no formal declaration of war. There was just, we're going to come get these people. And it took place and unfolded over centuries. And it was asymmetrical. In other words, if this had been like a war in the contemporary sense where you got one group of people instead of millions of people over millions of square miles with thousands of languages who don't know each other, who are being collected through this war on their bodies, then if had it been a declaration of war and all those people at one time would have found out they're at war, we wouldn't be having this conversation about this subject in this language. Because I am absolutely confident that we would have given them back more than they could handle. <laughs> and they would have went back up in there and said, let us continue what we were doing before we went to Africa, which is what? Enslaving each other. <laughs> but, you know, that's a story, story for another day. No, but actually, actually, it's a story for today. Fact, one of the things I was doing this weekend was watching High on the Hog on, yeah. um, on Netflix. And um, here's some good things about that, Prof. What you think? Yeah, no, I mean, the entry point, again, this is about remembering, you know, uh, the brother takes us to Benin. 
So mm-hmm. through, food, through food, we're getting a, a lesson about who we are, you know, culturally. And he's going back and they are talking about, you know, the, that, that walk from the interior to that ocean, to those boats, is st- the road is still there. And I was just processing, you know, because he took those steps and there's it was emotional mm. to get to that place where the people didn't make it. And then there's a, a little, you know, uh, they poured some libation, which we talked about, you know, um, um, before as well. You know, they they honored those folk that didn't get on the boat, that died before, because it was so brutal. That walk was brutal. The brutality kept him in the dark. Like he's going through the trauma. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, my God, you know, and for us to carry yams and you know seeds and all kinds of things to 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 sustain ourselves. And I was talking with Dr. Senyata about the little bags that you would see the little bags that had seeds in them that people just inherently brought with them. And even though these 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 were folk as you mentioned different languages, different tribes, different one one people because of what we could do, because of our greatness, because of our excellence, because of the because they couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. They needed us. Couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. it. So I'm sorry. I just, you know, as you were talking about that, this is the look, y'all. Isn't this the beauty of these Saturdays we spend together? This is the conversation. This is the conversation. And that is exactly right. That's why, as John Henry Clark said, if you start your history with slavery, everything since then looks like progress. And you can't start your history with slavery. And by that, I don't mean you don't start as a point of departure, the moment of capture. But if you anchor that moment in the idea that these people came from nowhere, now you've made now you've made the flaw. You can't fix it. If you start like that, you if that can't be fixed. And and that's why very clear. having these conversations and for us remembering mm-hmm. who we've always been. Right. D- Tanya Pinkins, uh, who is now joining me on my radio show every Wednesday. Uh, yes. Oh my good, and she's donating classes, uh, several to <laughs> People who, you know, who have hardship and we because we want everyone to be a part of narrative. So thank she's you. donating subscriptions. Um, and I want to thank her for that. She thank said you. something on my show on Wednesday that I can't shake. Just like Sonyada said, you know, when you replace I with we, you turn mm-hmm. illness into wellness. She said, we're seeds. We're the seeds. Oh, we are the seeds. So you push us down into the oh, ground. Oh. All we do is come back and gr- you can't get rid of us. We're the seeds. She said, we are the seeds. Yes, we are. You not get rid of us because you push us down. The further you push us down into that ground, we keep coming back. We keep coming back. And the, if you have the seed, you're good. In fact, I had to move my Malcolm. I meant to mention Brother uh, Muhammad from the, the the UK who sent me that Malcolm, right? Y'all remember Malcolm? Malcolm looking at y'all like, what you going to do? You've been had. You've been took. Bamboozled. Hoodwink. Run them up. But I had to move him for a minute so I could get to this book. That uh, by this sister, um, still alive, an incredible elder, a veteran of the civil rights movement, but more importantly, one of the greatest thinkers we produced in the 20th and 21st centuries, um, Marimba Ani, uh, who wrote a, a monster of a book, 600 and some pages, almost 630 pages, called Yurugu, an African Senate critique of European cultural thought and behavior. You know, I've known Mama Marimba for a long time. As I said, she was on the dissertation committee. I was very happy to have that committee, by the way. Um, it's important to understand. This, the, the intellectual work we do here would, surpa- would, would, would meet or surpass any standard at any university. That's why we're jailbreaking the university concept. We all learn together. But when you're in those structures, those university structures, if you get in a PhD, you have to have a dissertation committee. And I'm very happy to say that my dissertation committee was Marimba Ani, Nate Norman, Ella Forbes, Jacob Carruthers, and Theophile Obenga. That was the, that's the A team. In fact, you couldn't have that committee again now because Baba Baba Jetty is a uh, Jacob Carruthers is a is an ancestor. But I mentioned that because when you talk about the question of the seed, her notion of seed is at the center of this. In fact, she calls it the Asili. She used Kiswahili words to talk about the idea of culture. And this is just that this book actually started life as her dissertation, her own dissertation at the New School in New York. I mean, uh, anyway, you know what? Mm, I got to think about this. Maybe we should, we should do what you should know about Marimba. I need, but I need to check with her for first. Cause yeah, uh, yeah. cause uh, as, uh, as they used to say in the nation of Islam, those that say don't know and those that know don't say. So there's only so much <laughs> that you can, you know, but I want, but y'all get this book. Anyway, yeah. uh, Asili means seed, the logos of a culture. Mm. You know what I'm saying? The Asili, the logos of a culture, 
within which its various aspects cohere. It is the developmental germ or seed of a culture. It is the cultural essence, the ideological core, the matrix of a cultural entity, which must be identified in order to make sense of the collective creations of its members. So as you're describing High on the Hall, which I haven't had a chance to sit down and watch yet, but I will. I see my man, Michael Twitty, and a few other people that I know are involved in it. I said, okay, let me see what I can make of this. I'm gonna, And I'm hearing good things, including what you've been saying. So I said, I got to check it out. The, but when you raise this question of seeds, see, I think of, of cooking as combined as, as existing in all the conceptual categories, but let's just take 30 seconds to think about it. Cooking are ways of knowing not only how you prepare something consumed with your body in terms of how you treat that material object, that plant, but the process through which you do it, the collective nature, the convening, the assignment of work, the intergenerational transmission, all that's ways of knowing. So it isn't just what you're putting in your mouth. It's the how you're preparing, how you, you know. Isn't and he would the gumbo and he's like, how would you taste it? And he puts it on the back of his hand. Oh, and no he, question. He's, he, right. But how do you know that? Because you learned it. Right. You don't put your mouth on a spoon. You no, know, we all know that. We no, all know no. how to taste food without putting our mouth on a spoon. Without putting your mouth on a spoon. And, and you know what? Let's, let's, let's sit in that for a minute. Uh, sit down there for a minute, Karen. Now, if you're a child with a very specific task, it might be to sweep. It might be to help shuck the peas. It ain't yet to get to the hot stuff, to the fire, to the flame. But you got an other task now. If at a, at a critical moment, if you are asked to be a taster, you're going to eat off somebody's skin too. What way of knowing is being communicated then? Because you don't let just anybody eat off your body. That's right. It's one thing when you're eating off your body, which is in itself a way of knowing, but when you extend that to someone else, and often, even if it's already cool, if you're going to give it to a child, you're going to blow on it. That's right. There are rituals. What are you doing? You are reinforcing a way of knowing that says, I love you. That you don't have to, people say, oh, I love you. That's coming out your mouth. Show me in the ritual. And then people say, but so, so in other words, and I think about this in relation to our dear friend and brother, Paul Coates, who has, you know, I mean, this is a bibliophile book collector. We were talking about cookbooks last week of all things, Paul Coates. You know, but I'm thinking as we're talking now, that means you can't everything. When you talk about African-American cookbooks and I got all little Leah Chase's cookbooks, a lot of those cookbooks, you know, uh, Dorothy Height. When she had the Black Family Reunion, she has a number of cookbooks that came out of that, which, you know, are, have been were published. But guess what? If you're talking about our cooking. You can't write it all down. A lot of that stuff is behavior. Now, you could write the instruction down, but unless you're in the room, <laughs> if you don't know what that is, and it's people in the chat. I'm telling you, all need to be blowing the chat up because we want part of our conversations, really the core of our conversations is helping us, as Karen always says, Professor Hunter always says, remember, which means we're prompting. But you all know this. <laughs> and the thing is, how do we value it differently? And then finally, in terms of cooking, it's the science and technology. It's really science and technology. I mean, people say, you know, black folk got out. Yeah, I don't care where you from in the African world. It's hot. We use peppers. Uh, uh, Sunyata says that. Why? Y'all just like, no, no, no. Do you understand the medicinal value <laughs> of peppers? I mean, in other words, we ain't just in here eating stuff because we just like hot food. And we think, oh, I just like hot food. No, you don't just like hot food. When last time you had a cold? If you're from, I mean, of course, we'll lead us to Dr. Amin. So, 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 so tell, tell, tell me, Professor Hunter, I mean, yeah, as you're watching this, high on the hog, which is interesting because hog becomes the point of entry, but yes, hog is, a fo is affiliated with enslavement, which means you can start the conversation with the familiar thing, but if you only start and don't remember anything else, you get stuck on that hog, then you get stuck on high blood pressure, then you get stuck on, see, you have to put that hog in context. It sounds yes. to me like they're putting the hog in context. Oh my God, and that was the thing, because initially I was like, oh, macaroni and cheese, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> but it was not, it was, it was, they went there. They went exactly where they needed to go, which is to go all the way back to talk about those same, the yam being that perfect vegetable, that perfect sustenance, yam as, as Senyata, Dr. Senyata said, to, to eat, literally to eat. Maybe she didn't do that here because yeah, we started, did. Okay, did. okay. We started a whole series this week on uh you know food and we did an introduction and that's gonna be a narrative too. She's gonna about to blow your whole entire existence as it relates to health and eating. And I want to thank her for that uh commitment. But yeah, even even taking you know um all of the pieces of anything, she said we're African. 
you 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 kill a game, you're gonna use every part of it. So we were not unfamiliar with you giving us these, you know, the snout and the tail and it, you know, we weren't that was not unfamiliar to us because in the bush we may have taken an animal and eaten every single part because nothing goes to waste. And that is also cultural. And I I felt good about that. Even the macaroni and cheese. You know, the history of that black man, which you mentioned George Washington's uh, cook and Thomas Jefferson's cook, yes. who they enslaved. And then when um, Hercules wanted to leave. My man Hercules. Hercules wanted to leave, which he eventually did. Yes, he did. Washington put him back in the field, put him in the field. Of course. Yeah, as punishment, right? So, I mean, they go through all of that. Oh, Even I, I read this book a long time ago uh, called The Prince of Darkness uh, about Jeremiah mm -hmm. Hamilton. And in that book, they mentioned the brother in Wall Street uh, yeah. who had the clams. Yes. And high on a hog, they go through the whole, they do a whole clam thing. Uh, oyster, sorry, oyster bar. Oyster. Had the biggest oyster bar in, on Wall Street. And they go through all of that. It's it, it's it's amazing. So shout out oh. uh, for that. That's, uh, that's yeah. very interesting how food works in there, isn't it? I mean, when you go through uh, Paul Robeson's family, for example, you have the Bustles, who were caterers, who fed uh, the the army of George Washington early on. And George Washington, you're not my dad, so this ain't no shout out to you, bro. Because Ona Judge and Hercules told you and Martha who y'all was when they got the hell up out of there. And those of you all who know that how that works, it, you know, Pennsylvania by then was a state where if you stayed in that state, if you were enslaved beyond a certain date. I think I forget what it was, or something like that. You had, you had to free you. Yeah, shipping them back. I mean, but that was the other thing, um, Dr. Carr. You know, even that, you know, the, I think um, the the narrator, um, and I can't, uh, his name is escaping me because I know the, the title of the book is, a, is uh, a riff on Dr. Jessica Harris's book, High on the Hog, and she's in the first episode. Good. But even he says, you know, we want to romanticize the history and the mythology of America, you know, but. We have to tell the truth. We, he, uh, one of the guys said, "America's Americans are like ostriches. Ostriches. We we bury our heads in the sand. We don't want to know the the true things." As if everybody sitting here, you know, nobody here was enslaved. Nobody enslaved anybody. But we gotta tell the truth about it. Like I don't get it. You're running away from history. Well, Prof, I think this is where it's an interesting conversation, right? This is where I say again, there's no we. See the the trick the trick in this settler state we call the United States is to assert a we. As a as a violent, act. this is part of the war, the war in our minds. They assert the we as a violent act of erasure, and then when we repeat the re the we, we are assaulting ourselves. People say, "Well, you know, we don't want to remember who is we." I don't like I don't like these people. So how in the hell you think I like George Washington? You keep bringing me in this conversation like I wouldn't have done what on a judge and 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 and. and, and um, Hercules did. Right. I mean, shout out to uh, uh, Avenging the Ancestors Coalition in Philadelphia. My man, Mike Cord and all the Africans. I was right there with them. Uh, Charles Bloxon, uh, my, you know, Baba Charles, who I worked with for many years, worked for, uh, who fought that fight for decades because they created something in as they were uh, what they call it, the, the most uh, the most historic square mile in America where Independence Hall sits on one end and then they got the National Constitution. I was there for the dedication of the National Constitution Center, in fact, when they dedicated it. Um, but at any rate, I'm saying all that to say, because I was living in Philly. Now, I always go down there. They have a corner there. They built a new building for the so-called Liberty Bell. And then just beyond it is the footprint of what was known as the President's House. Um, and there's been a couple of books, was one book written on the president's house, but I'm I, the title escapes me and it's not necessary anyway, because again, what I don't like is after these traumas are inflicted on black people, years later, people come along, can try to cannibalize the memory and then produce scholarship on it. It's published by university, white university presses and stuff. I'm like, when are we, when are we going to understand that this war continues in different forms? But anyway, I won't get into yeah. that, but beyond the Liberty Bell, then there's a, there's a, there's a footprint building that commemorates the so-called president's house. But black people out of the governance structure of Philadelphia surrounding areas for years protested, stopped construction, went to war. And then black people at every stage of the debate, shout out to all the black women and men, particularly the sisters uh, who were involved with the National Park Service, park rangers, the sister who was over that region for the National Park Service, who was there at the dedication of the president's house eventually, because every time black people put their bodies on the line, marching with the red, black and green flags, so-called July 4th, down there protesting, we'd be down there. And when we had freedom school, the freedom school students was down there. I mean, just shutting it down. 
the government had to back up. And they said, no, nah, y'all, y'all are going to see the president's house. You know, the first capital of the United States was Philadelphia. I used to tell students how to our time in the morning. I get up and get on the train. I leave the city where they made up America to the city. They made up for America, Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. So I mean, I go back to the city where they made it up. The criminal enterprise was was mapped out in Philadelphia. And so for the first few years, the presidents lived right there in the shadow of the old Pennsylvania State House, which we call Independence Hall. George Washington lived there. And, and so and so because of that protest and the Philadelphians know this, some of y'all probably blowing up the chat now talking about it. You can see on a judge, you can see Hercules because that's where they were enslaved and they was going to build that thing without thinking, oh, George Washington was here and Martha White and here's where the food and don't you love the passive language? It's like when they say, for example, Terrence Crutcher, uh, who lost his life and his and his twin sister, Dr. Crutcher, is one of the people leading that Tulsa struggle right now who will never let us forget. But uh, when they say, oh, Terrence Crutcher uh, uh, uh was killed while in police custody, was killed while being apprehended. No, you killed him, Betty. You killed Terrence Crutch. When they say, well, here's where the food was prepared in the Washington household. The food was prepared. So the food decided, okay, we want to get in your belly. So we're going to sit here, cook ourselves, and then jump in. All this passive language because, <laughs> no, here's where you enslaved Hercules who made, uh, uh, who made, Everything alchemy, you know what I'm saying, and yeah. kept your ass alive. You know what I'm saying. And let me shout out, thank you, uh, Mar Rich in the in the chat. Stephen Satterfield uh, is the narrator. I think one of the producers as well. And they even talk about how Martha Washington had a bunch of recipes. Yeah, had a bunch of recipes. She had a bunch of recipes, but you know, as they're doing historical, you know, putting this piece back together, she had all these recipes, but Hercules was the person cooking. Right. Somebody asked, well, what were his recipes? Well, we imagine anything that Martha Wash Washington took credit for. Right. Came from Hercules. Right. And and then there's even a piece in there about eminent domain and how there's a farm in North Carolina that they're literally building a highway through. As we oh. talk about Tulsa, as we talk about what happened to Tulsa after Tulsa rebuilt, after Greenwood, Greenwood rebuilt. Yes. Which we did a narrative, so we're not going to do it here. But I was watching that, thinking about our conversation and how many communities were destroyed. I know in Jackson, Mississippi, I know Mount ba Bayou, they they went through and cut it off from, from any kind of resources. It was thriving and then it wasn't. And right. it wasn't because black people did anything wrong. Nope. And so we have to remember and we have to talk right. about it. And because we're to see, you can keep trying to bury us. We're going to keep growing. Right. We'll keep growing. In fact, that's what I'm, we're gonna come to all that. We, yeah, I'm glad you said it. But, no, no, no. Finn, take us home. No, 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 no. We're tying it. This is all part of this conversation. This is all part of this conversation. So, yeah, the president's house. You can see that there, and um, and so that you know, and and I can't wait to watch High on the Hog now. Um, you know, if Washington being diabolical, um, people say well, he's very clever. It ain't clever if, she, if it's your mama who two days before the deadline in Pennsylvania, they put on a horse and wagon and take back down to Mount Vernon, Virginia, where she only has to stay for a few days and then they bring her back to Philadelphia because the clock starts again. That's what that's how they did it. So like you say, you're going to put Hercules in the field. I see you, Mount Vernon, right down the street. I've been down there many times and paid my respects. Left a lot of saliva on the, uh, on the plantation. <laughs> of, uh, including at the grave of George Washington. Uh, what is that a crime? Well, if that's a crime, then you know, <laughs> Sade said, Is it a crime? No, it's not a crime in the governance structure. Now, those you Negroes a little scared, you know what I'm saying? You, know, you spit on the ground, I spit on the ground too, just in certain select paces. I call it paying my respects. So, at any rate, um, yeah, when I use the, you know, anyway, crime scene investigations, which actually <laughs> ties to Memorial Day because you know, my nephew. Uh, my friend uh, Dana Williams, her nephews, you know, we were around Memorial Day weekend and, and 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 they send the children to us. You send children to us when they were little. We take them to Arlington National Cemetery because there's a lot of Africans out there. Joe Lewis is out there. Mega Wiley Evers is out there. Thurgood Marshall is out there. Colonel Charles Young is out there under a beautiful big piece of stone with Young on the side. Had the biggest funeral in history of D.C. to that date. The great Colonel Charles Young. But at any rate. So our ancestors are there. Many Africans who died before and during the Civil War buried under tombstones, simple tombstones with one word on the side, citizen. It's very powerful, you understand. But you know who else is out there? 
There's a Confederate monument, a stone's throw from the Buffalo Soldiers Monument that uh, that uh, what's the brother's name? Uh, Colin Powell will help get out there with the pressure from folks getting out there. And he himself said, you know, I'm with the Buffalo Soldiers. I'm in the military. I'm in the military. Yes, we're going to do that. But then you go across a little road and you look and there's a damn Confederate monument out there. Yeah, because the Confederates are buried in Arlington National Cemetery, which was the uh, former plantation owned by Robert E. Lee. But how did Lee get it? Lee came through the Custis line, married into the family, in other words, through his wife of George and Martha Washington. Because you see George Washington, the father of your country, he's not my dad. George Washington, the first president of the United States of America, the military man. George Washington uh, didn't have the capital and the bank his wife had. And when he died, he said, well, Washington freed, he should have freed him before, but when he died, he freed his slaves. Yeah, now the question you need to ask, how many did he have to free? Because most of them were Martha's enslaved human beings. And so Martha did not free those Africans. And in fact, she sent some of them down with a granddaughter to what became Arlington Plantation. And so Africans, enslaved Africans toiled on that plantation until the Civil War when Robert E. Lee, who uh, along with, uh, Wait, right. Y'all had to go to narrative for that. In our conversation on John Brown, who did they send to Harper's Ferry in 1859 to kill John Brown, the rest of them? They sent Robert E. Lee with the Marines. And he also had a guy called Jeb Stewart. In fact, Stonewall Jackson was there at the hanging. In fact, have I just named three of the four people on the side of Stone Mountain in Georgia to this day? Anyway, go over there to narrative for the rest. Of but my point is, when he took the other side, Eventually, the quartermaster of the army uh, of the army was it Montgomery Meigs? I don't know. I'm trying to remember now, but they took that plantation and used it as the burial ground for the dead in the war. Beginning with the first bodies, they they tow up Robert E. Lee's wife's rose garden right by the house and started planting bodies right there. That's where there is, that's why there is an article in Arlington National Cemetery. Shout out to all the women and men of the U.S. Park Service uh, who know this story in part because of women and men like the great Elizabeth Clark Lewis, who is the director of public history for many years at Howard University, who has kept this story alive and trained so many people in the Park Service. Uh, my friend, Dr. Joy Kennard, who is the guardian of Charles Young's place. She used to be over Mary McLeod Bethune and Carsey Woodson's house. Um, Tower Green, so many other. That's a lot of black women in the National Park Service, but I know one of those young sisters very well because she, that's my child who is now teaching at Bowie State University as a PhD. She was a park ranger out there when she was a young girl while she was still an undergrad. Uh, Shanice Thompson, who uh, made sure when she took on tour, I'm going to show you where the black people are around here. And they preserved the Custis House, the Quander family, so many other stories we can talk about Arlington. But anyway, again, rituals of memory, because this is Memorial Day weekend, which means they're going to put American flags over everybody's tomb. And you know, you're not supposed to leave flowers in Arlington. But black people are real funny. We figure out ways. I guarantee you that between now and Monday, I, if I'm able to go over there, because I, I sometimes I'll go out there. I pay respect to the ancestors. You have to do that. When I, I'll go out there, when you see Mega Everest, little he, Mega Everest is buried under the same small obelisk shaped piece of white stone that my father is buried under in the, in the Veterans Cemetery in Tennessee. In other words, you all know many of y'all got people in the military, name, rank, you know, this kind of thing, birth date, death date. You're not supposed to leave flowers out there. Or you, you have little, they have rules, a lot of rules, you know. But somehow, American Negroes, so when you go to the grave of Megar Wiley Evers, you know what you see? You see that white stone, and on the top of it, you see little pebbles. These Negroes, <laughs> they get rocks in other places and leave them stone. I say, I say, I say. You see stones lying in the top. Joe Lewis, stones. Right? But Megar Evers, I don't know if I've ever seen anybody with more. Uh, uh, Major Augusta is out there, who was the surgeon at, at Freedman's Hospital, now Howard University Hospital. He was one of the first two black majors in the Civil War. He, uh, the other one was Martin Delaney, who we'll talk about now. Now, what does this have to do with Tulsa? What does that have to do with Memorial Day? It has everything to do with it because we're talking about rituals and how we remember. And what we're talking about is not just remembering the trauma, but remembering the triumph. Meaning, when you think about Memorial Day, when you think about what's going on in Tulsa this week, last week, this weekend, and then Monday after Monday, the rest of the week, you're talking about an all out war over memory, 
a war over memory, not just the trauma. Because if you turn on television now, you look at the newspaper, everybody talking about the trauma. Everybody's talking about the trauma. In fact, Professor Hunter, uh, you know, when you and I were growing up, many of y'all watching this, if you got the magazine National Geographic, one time you seen black people is with their clothes off. Right. Titties out. Titties out. <laughs> Maybe a little uh, belt of beads or something. It's like, now, let me pause here and say, the reason them people ain't got no clothes on is because they're in a tropical environment. And if Europeans had grown up in their environment, they wouldn't have no clothes on either. So we, we, we should probably dedicate one of our conversations to the origins of pornography, the origins of the objectification, pornographia, literally the writing of harlots. In other words, going back through France I and mean, when you started objectifying the body and making nudity something to be ashamed. I mean, anyway, that's all nothing. But the reason they ain't got no clothes on is very practical. Re- in fact, I'm not saying they ain't got no clothes on. I'm using Ebonics. I'm using contemporary diaspora. Or, oh, by the way, shout out to our third world famous. I got this diaspora. I'm part of diaspora, right? Diaspora, you know, dear me too, right? I mean, you know, so the twinning, in other words, if we weren't born on the continent of Africa, we still born in the African world. And one of the definitions of diaspora has to do with fracturing and and and, and what happens in the in, in the residue of being cooked. So in other words, when you burn something, the smoke comes out. We part of smoke. We all have a relationship. But anyway, um, as I was saying, this whole notion then of being having no clothes on, yeah, that's a diaspora thing. Maybe go put some clothes on. But you might have something on. You might have a wristband on. You might have some waist beads on. Different, in other words, what we call adornment. A lot of times clothing is adornment. It isn't just protection from the elements. If you're in an environment where you don't need that kind of protection from the elements and you still put something on, it's because you this signifies a very deliberate thing. It's a text to be read. And there's a whole shelf of books and, and scholarship and conversations about that. But anyway, that was what was in National Geographic. Now, fast forward to the latest National Geographic. This is the June. This is the brand new issue. Just came out. Kadir Nelson has the cover. Mm. Reckoning with the past, the century after the Tulsa race massacre. It's a beautiful piece. Look at that beautiful family. In fact, it reminds me of this children's book. Let me see if I have it. So, ah, yes. This brother, Floyd Cooper, he got a Coretta Scott King Award for his, his illustrations. Uh, Carol Boston Weatherford did the, 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 uh, the book, did the actual book I'm about to show you. But the brother who did the illustrations, Floyd Cooper, is from Tulsa. He's born and raised in Tulsa. And he first heard about what happened in Tulsa in 1924. 21 from his grandfather who survived it as a young man so this is the book this is a great book for children look at this unspeakable the toss look at that picture man. Mm. also race massacre carol board boston weatherford and floyd cooper it's a beautiful and the thing is you fold it out mm. see and of course kadir nelson gonna do right by the black family but here's the question you gotta ask yourself because they got on all the clothes did everybody is part of our conversation of black, about Black Wall Street in Tulsa? And, and by the way, those of you in the chat, start dropping in the places where in your city, wherever it is, the United States, the Caribbean, Africa, Europe, wherever, Europe meaning England, France, because you see these pockets of black people building businesses, building communities all over the diaspora and in Africa. So start dropping some of those places in. Cause again, this isn't just a, a conversation Professor Hunter and I are having. This is a conversation we are having. And it helps us understand that governance structure category in the African States framework. Not who we are to other people, but who we are to each other. Now, this is who we are to each other, part of it. But everybody didn't have suits and dresses like this. Everybody didn't own a business. How much of the black Wall Street narrative is us trying to prove that we are as civilized, as educated, as prosperous. Guess what? You came out of your mother's womb, which means what? You have equal value to everybody else who did. This is a difficult concept for us to get our minds around because part of the ways we remember, the part of, re- part of the ways the social structure wants us to remember is to erase the complexity of human life and to then set a standard for them to say, you know what? Y'all came out of slavery, but if you keep working hard and keep your nose clean, Maybe one day you could be close to us as human. So then we internalize it. And then somebody gets shot. We lead with, they were honor student. Can we get a graduation picture? Why you got to do that? I want you to get a picture of them, turn up at the club and put it there and say, so what? (laughs) Stop 
reinforcing this idea that black death, even in death, you got to be respectable by somebody else's stand. You killed me. I don't give a damn if I was butt ass naked walking down the street. You shot me, Betty. Now my sister got to be out here caping for me in Tulsa. We was born and raised in Tulsa. Because guess what? June 1st, 1921 wasn't the first time y'all came for us. And it wasn't the last time, which is where we get into this. But I wanted to mention that this National Geographic, because in this National Geographic, there are a number of people writing. Um, Elizabeth Alexander, you know, and she says, you know, Elizabeth Alexander has a piece called Envisioning Black Freedom. And she says, to stop perpetuating the racism of the past, we must live like we understand what the history teaches us. Yeah, with all due respect, that ain't gonna happen. That ain't gonna happen. Do you know why? For two reasons. Number one, there ain't no we. There ain't no we. You know why there's so many black people writing in this issue right here? And Kadir Nelson got the cover? It's because National Geographic realized if you wanna stay in business, you gotta change your practices. Why? Because the people in the governance structure are not gonna tolerate this and the world is looking more and more like us. And so if you want to sell this, you're going to have to change something. That's one of the reasons. By the way, uh, I was reading something in the Financial Times last week. In fact, it was on the front page of the FT one day last week. And it said, by the end of this century, now the demographics, they are constantly revising. And the revisions constantly improve for Africa. So it is a long article on demographic shifts in the world. And the New York Times actually had one, too, which leads me to think, man, this is really on y'all's mind. If it gets to the public like this, they're saying, you know, everything's cratering. Asia's cratering. Europe death, birth rate down. And then like this was a full page article in the Times, like three paragraphs in the first couple of sentences said in Africa, the, uh, the birth rate is actually going up. And the majority of the people there are under 24 years old. And then it went back to I'm saying, whoa, 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 go back to that. In the FT on the front page, they had a they had a a, a, demogra a demographic breakdown. It says there's gonna be more people in Nigeria by the end of this century than in China. What y'all think about that? Africa and Africans are the future. This is why this this is this ain't no this ain't charity. In other words, <laughs> this is I gotta stay in business. So I'm mentioning that because they do a good. They have a spread here on what got lost in June 1921. As uh, in Tulsa, as the, as Professor Hunter said, we're not going to talk about it. Uh, I'll mention there's 1,115 homes burned, numerous buildings. Uh, they filed 193 lawsuits. Of course, those lawsuits were dismissed. Of course, John Hope Franklin's father, Buck, that's his autobiography, My Life in the Era, the, who was from Renchersville, which is one of those many all-black towns in Oklahoma. And, you know, there were a lot of all-black towns, as you said. In fact, I thought I had a couple of books on. Yeah, there are a couple of good books on, well, a number of good books. This is one by Kenneth Hamilton, Black Towns and Profit, Promotion and Development in the Trans-Appalachian West, 1877 to 1915. This is when you see Tulsa jump off, but you have other places that jumped off as well. In fact, Oklahoma was full of all black towns. We're going to talk about that in a second. Uh, Kansas. A lot of people came out of Kansas. This is Nicodemus, Kansas. This is uh, Charlotte Hanger's book, Nicodemus. I just pulled a couple to give you a sense. But my point is that they find their way into Tulsa. You see this element of destruction. They're chronicling it in National Geographic because they can't get around it. And then uh, my man Clint Smith, oh, look, look, you know they shook when The Economist, this is the latest Economist with George Floyd in the front, Race in America, a special report. See, people say, why y'all read, why you read them white magazines? No, 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 no. His instinct, he got to stand by the social structure. These are the publications that are used to communicate and signal to the people who make decisions how they going to move next. So I don't anchor and orient my interpretation of anything around what they say. I, in fact, I almost look at it like doing intelligence. I'm doing reconnaissance. You know, I'm not, I don't, I don't, I don't depend on anything written by anybody writing in any of those publications for the way I think about things. And I don't think anybody should, you should read things with your own lens. That's what we're doing on Saturdays. But finally, in terms of th this week's magazines, this is the, uh, this is the Atlantic for this month. The War on Nostalgia, my, my man Clint Smith wrote a book recently. He says, what will it take to end the myth of the lost cause? I'm like, Clint, bruh, end the myth of the lost cause? <laughs> Clint Smith is a, is a brilliant brother, and I know he knows where he lives. I also know that, you know, part of being kind of in that role of trying to interpret for other people and trying to build bridges is that you got to talk out of both sides or your mouth or several million sides to try to fit. But when you're talking like that, you 
I don't. I, 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 there's a value for it. I'm not going. I'm not going to dog Clint Smith at all because I like Clint Smith, good brother. But I'm just saying. But this is what he writes about. He talks about going to these Civil War um, cemeteries, Memorial Day. We're going to talk about that in a second. And he talks about. He starts with this going to a cemetery in Petersburg, Virginia. Tanahasi Coates did this a few years ago, going to Civil War sites. Jelani Cobb, you know, and me. I, look, I'm a Civil War. I be in the Civil War. Because I believe the Civil War, that period, that that decade of the 1860s, as far as I'm concerned, that's not only when American history starts in some ways, that's also when it ends. I'm like the wrong Bennett Jr. Y'all had one chance. You people say you had one job. <laughs> you had one chance and you blew it. And for the next century, you see black people fighting our way out, migrating to all black towns, negotiating, doing it together. Then we get to the 1960s and try to give y'all another chance. But you really kind of, and since then, you have been determined. And by you, I mean white nationalists. I'm not talking about all white people. I'm not talking about individual white people. I'm talking about the concept of preserving whiteness to the last dog dies, either through direct action, shout out January 6, 2021, or indirect action. Everybody's saying, well, what can we do? I mean, we got to convince, uh, shout out to Joe Manchin. Oh, we got to convince. I'm, 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 I'm ashamed. I'm concerned. Okay. Take out shame, take out concern, understand in a war is two sides and understand that you are either with them or running around between getting shot by both sides. But it ain't no million sides in this. These people tried to overthrow your government because they said this is a white man's country. This is a white woman's country. You even had to kill a couple of them and they killed more than a couple of you and some of us, which means we caught up in this thing and you got to pick a side as he's saying the civil rights movement. Which side are you on, boys? Which side are you on? So in that context, Clint is writing about being in this Virginia uh, cemetery. And he says, you know, they're laying out American flags. They're talking about he said, almost all the people who come to Bland for cemetery are white. It's not that the black population doesn't appreciate the windows. So they have these stained glass windows with all these different symbols in it, including Confederate symbols. And then he talks about going to the visitor symbol. And he says, I looked at this flyer. They gave him a flyer while he was there trying to read between her fingers. This lady has this flyer. It was a handout for a Memorial Day event at Blafford hosted by the Sons of Confederate Veterans. Palsy Grambling Jr., then the commander in chief of the group, would be speaking. It was May 2019 and the event was just a few weeks away. I don't mind that they come on Memorial Day and put Confederate flags on Confederate graves. That's OK, she said. But as far as I'm concerned, you don't need a Confederate flag on. She stumbled over a series of sentences I couldn't follow. Then she collected herself and took a deep breath. If you're just talking about history, it's great. But these folks are like the South shall rise again. It's very bothersome. Right. Now, I've been to. I've been to our International Cemetery many times. I've been to that Confederate monument many times. And. I think like Minister Farrakhan often says, among many others, he said, now, the atrocities that we suffered under that Confederate flag were for a small period of time, but the atrocities we suffered under that other red, white, and blue flag stretch from the beginning of that flag to today. And so if you're going to have a serious conversation, that's why when Elizabeth Alexander says, we got to learn from our history, who is we? And when you start talking about learning, what do you mean? Because the, the police killing people are not killing them with Confederate flags technically on their shoulders. They got American flags on their shoulder and the flags of their state. And so please understand that if we're having a serious conversation, this turns out something very different. So let's just do these two quick things and then we'll we'll take it because. Um, let's go back for a second to the origins of Memorial Day. This this day when you go out and put flags, including Confederate flags, a lot of places. This day when if we hadn't had this plague, uh, my dear friend and brother, uh, Larry Kwaku, Larry Crow in Dayton, Ohio, one of our greatest living historians um, would be organizing there in his native uh, Dayton, Ohio, just a ritual that started out of Chicago many years ago with Jacob Carruthers and Anderson Thompson and uh, Ife Carruthers and Yvonne Jones and so many others, Rosetta Cash, I could name them all, the Comedic Institute, Charles Carolyn Grantham, so many, Mario Bell, I could name them all. They would go and still go on Memorial Day weekend to the grave of Martin Delaney in Xenia, Ohio, and I would be there right now. We would be doing in class from uh, likely the, and the next year's time, we would be doing in class from the first 
National Museum of African American History and Culture, which is not on the mall here in Washington, D.C. My friend Kinshasa Conwell and all the folks down there, new director Kevin Young, uh, but in Wilberforce, Ohio, right out, right next to the campus, in fact, of Wilberforce University. And that is the museum that was started in 1976, still in operation. And we would have a, a conference on Martin Delaney and then go to the grave site and do that ritual. And when you go into that graveyard, you see those American flags are little American flags are placed in front of all the veterans. That includes the veterans of uh, the U.S. colored troops, of which Martin Delaney was one, along with General Augusta, who is buried, of course, as I said, in Arlington. Uh, Major, I'm sorry, Major Augusta. Major Delaney is buried with his wife and several of their children, uh, Cleopatra, Ramses, Toussaint Louverture. They named all their children for black people, movement and memory, black heroes, women and men are buried there in Ohio. Um, also in that graveyard are the children of Colonel Charles Young, who is buried in uh, Arlington National Cemetery. But his children are out there because he was an instructor. In fact, he taught at Wilberforce. In fact, as I said, my friend uh, um, Joy Kennard is the director of the Charles Young house. His house is right there between Wilberforce and, and the cemetery. Uh, also out there. Well, anyway, I could start talking about all the faculty from Wilberforce who are out there, but I, I, won't, I won't get too deep into that. Um, but at any rate. Those are rituals of remembrance. Um, but what Clint is writing about is contested memory in a cemetery where they still keeping the memory alive. The sons of the Confederate uh, uh, veterans are there. And of course, we all know the daughters of the American Revolution. If for no reason, they put up most of them damn statues y'all trying to tear down. And they did it years after the Civil War because rituals are important. Rituals reinforce memory, but they also inform vision where you're going. So Memorial Day does not begin with Europeans. In fact, my man, Wilbert Jenkins, there are so many books that I could talk about, but I'm just going to mention Wilbert Jenkins because it's a name you may not have heard. Uh, Wilbert Jenkins, who was my dear friend, who was, got his PhD from Howard University. But when I met him, he was on the faculty at uh, at Temple, Temple University in the history department. When you when you hear Wil Wilbert Jenkins, uh, oh, what's the name? What's the name of his book? Um, to See the New Day or something like that. I'm trying to remember. He wrote a book on black people in Charleston during and after the Civil War. That's a very important conversation for us to have because he talks about what became known as Decoration Day. So let's talk about Decoration Day for a second. What is Decoration Day? During 1865, now this is during the Civil War. The Civil War, in other words, April 1865, Robert E. Lee, good West Point trained, you know, general who decides that he's going to go with uh, the South. Who else was trained at West Point? Custer. Yeah, Custer. Uh, Oliver Otis Howard, Howard University. All these guys was friends. Then they then they squatted up on different squads. And then after the war was over, a lot of them tried to continue to be friends. And in General Howard's case, he started chasing Native Americans, chased Chief Seattle all the way out to the Pacific uh, Ocean. But in Thunder in the Mountains, get that book. You tell you about your friend, General Howard. But anyway, that's a whole nother conversation. Again, George Washington, you're not my dad. Neither are any of your cousins, my father. So anyway, when you look at what happened with uh, Decoration Day in Charleston, South Carolina, black soldiers are the first among the first who come down there and liberate that city. Remember, Charleston is one of the places, really the place where the Civil War got set off. John C. Calhoun on them. We've talked about them. Lee surrenders to Grant at Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia in April 19, 1865. Before that, Black people in Charleston start acting free. Them Negroes have organized themselves into schools. They've got a Freedmen's Bureau guy who's down there helping them. You got, uh, you know, Black people are starting to build businesses. The war not even over yet, not technically over. And what did they do? What did they do the 1st of May, 1865? According to the reports of newspapers at the time, my friend Dr. Wilbert Jenkins and others write about this. Uh, many people give credit to David Blight, who wrote a book called Race and Reunion. And that's an important book. And in fact, there's another book that's good. Kathleen Clark, Defining Moments, does a book on, you know, these uh, African-American commemoration and political culture in the South, 1863 to 1913. But I mentioned Wilbert Jenkins because I, I have his book somewhere back there in the back. I hope it's not in storage, but I think I saw it back there a few few months ago, but I couldn't find it for this morning. But anyway, I, you know, having read it, I know what's in it. Um, they talk about this. Nearly 10,000 people in Charleston, South Carolina, May the 1st, 1865. Mostly 
formerly enslaved Africans. They call them freed men. My friend Catherine Frankie writes about that in, in her book, Repair. On the 1st of May, they gathered to commemorate people who lost their lives, soldiers who lost their lives in the Civil War. Now watch this. These black people dug up, dug up the soldiers who had been buried in a mass grave in a Confederate prison camp in Charleston. Dug them up, Professor Hunter. I want y'all to stop and think about that for a minute. These Africans came, were enslaved in Charleston and surrounding areas. Okay, one of the people in the, in the, uh, the National Geographic that's talked about in here is, of course, our sister Bree Newsom, who took that Confederate flag down in Columbia, South Carolina. And that's very important. Remember, she, everybody talked about Bree Newsom. In fact, they got a picture of Bree Newsom in here, that famous picture where, I don't know if I can find it quickly. If I can't find it quickly, I'm going to keep going because Tulsa is really at the center of this National Geographic art. I can't find it, but y'all seen that, that picture. But I want to raise the name of the brother who had is the reason why they had to put a fence up around that damn flag. And that was a brother who they called Reverend E.X. Slave. <laughs> that was his nickname. He died at 57 years old back in the early 2000s. I never got a chance to meet him. But my man, um, my man, Bernie Gallman in uh, in South Carolina, in Columbia, knew him, knew him well. And so. When they put that 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 fence up, Bernie told me the story why. So if you know the name Bree Newsom and don't know the name Emmett Rufus Sonny Eddie E D D Y Jr., then you have you have not gone far enough. Because four Bree Newsom got up there and got that flag off. Emmett Eddie Jr., who called himself Reverend E X Slave, meaning ex slave, would go out there in all kind of weather, summer, winter time. Sometimes you have on a Santa Claus suit. You can't make this up and stand over on the other side of the South Carolina State House, other side of the street. And then when nobody was looking, he had a step ladder. He would go over there and he wasn't climbing the pole to take the flag down. He had a lighter. <laughs> Sonny Eddie tried to burn that flag so many times he was arrested and jailed. They let him out. You look over. There's Sonny on the other side of the street with his Santa Claus suit and his stepladder waiting. Police go around. He's over there that fast. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember the first time I went to Columbia and then the second time I went to Columbia, second time I went to Columbia, South Carolina, unlike the first time, I seen the Confederate flag on the pole, except this time they had a police cruiser parked out in front. I said, what happened? Sonny Eddie been at that flag again. Now, here's the thing. Shout out to Bree Newsom, but y'all see how this works. If you take your memory from people in the social structure, you think that's the first time. Black people, and, and, and in my mind, I'm thinking now somebody in Columbia watching this, help us understand who was there before Sonny Eddie. In other words, quit acting like these individual actors emerge out of the ether. And no, you gotta have rituals of remembrance. So at any rate, let's continue with what became known as Decoration Day. They dug up those bodies. They dug up those bodies, Professor Hunter. And when they dug them up to sell, have a May Day ceremony, they traced out a new cemetery. They found those bodies. Many of those bodies were black people. Many of those bodies were not black people. They were white people. They were soldiers. They reburied those bodies. And on May the 1st, 1865, 10,000 people, mostly black, gathered to commemorate those war dead. Involved this is not, a, go read Wilbert's book. Re, read Wilbert's book. And you get Wilbert's book, he'll tell you about this. Involved 3,000 black school children. Well, it's 1865. The war, no, them Negroes organized schools like, boom, 3,000. 3,000 black school children, mutual aid societies, union troops, black ministers, white Northern missionaries. And those children laid flowers at the graves, those reburied soldiers. A couple of years later, they began calling that ritual Decoration Day. Decoration Day. And three years later, it was moved to the 30th of May, officially by the United States Army, and renamed Memorial Day. Come on. Memorial Day. Do you understand, Professor Hunter? I mean, I mean, come on now. All these great filmmakers down here, this is a narrative film right here. They dug the bodies up. 
You're not, you're not, you're not lying in a Confederate prison camp. Three thousand school children, Professor. Black school children, school children. They were slaves two days ago. Oh, go to hell! I'm learning my letters, but my job today is to lay these flowers. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> we are the seeds. We are the seeds. We are the seeds. Now we now now I should mention this because I know it's time. We we're right we're up to a close now. But I have to mention this because if we were in class. In a, in a classroom at Howard, this is what I would do. I think I would do. Because again, if you've got younger people, and I'll just mention these right quick because we're not going to get into these. I'm glad to see this book actually be published. It's actually being republished. I hope I have it somewhere close. If I don't, I'm going to have to just mention it in passing. Oh no, I got to have this one. But anyway, here's one of the ones I'm looking for. Uh, the sister who actually survived the uh, Tulsa 1921 wrote a book of her account and they republished it. It just came out. Everything's being published now to, yeah, here it is, coincide with the uh, 100th anniversary. This is Mary Parrish. The Nation Must Awake is what they call the book, My Witness to the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921. Mary Parrish, let me show you her picture. There she is. Mm-hmm. Now, the thing that bothers me, Trinity University Press, San Antonio, Texas. Hey, I'm glad it's better. I mean, I have one of the older copies, of course, but this just came out. Everybody can get it. But here's the problem. You attack black people. You wait 100 years. Then you pay yourself and praise yourself to write about the attack of black people. Oh, see, the problem with this is, and this is what's going on in Tulsa. This is where we're going to end today. But if you look at, this is a book uh, Alvarine Ball and Stacey Robinson put together. Very good, just came out. It's called Across the Tracks. So, if you got a young person remembering Greenwood, Black Wall Street, and Tulsa Race Massacre, this is a good book. I didn't mention it last year because when we did the long thing, which you can look at uh, on narrative, it wasn't out. They, well, everything I'm showing you now wasn't out last year. So, including this one, uh, this brother will actually be there this weekend. Uh, he's in Tulsa now. He's a great historian, Carlos Hills, Tulsa Race Massacre, Photographic History. This is where he talks about how they built it back. And of course, by the 1940s, they had more businesses than they had in the 1920s. But what happened in Tulsa happened everywhere. As you mentioned, that highway uh, in North Carolina. Um, when you mentioned that highway, that same highway, they call it I-65, where I'm from, Nashville, that split Jefferson Street. It's the same highway with no off or uh, no on ramps that they ran through many of the black communities in this country. And so that's the same highway that they ran through Tulsa. In fact, this is the highway that separates North Tulsa, which is not where they are doing the, the so-called gentrification is now spread creeping into North Tulsa, but that highway split and that highway was part of the reason they were able to attack Wall Street, Greenwood, and all of those places. Remember that in fact, today at the baseball stadium that Stacey Abrams is not speaking at and John Legend is not singing at. We'll talk about that in a second. I know you had the brother on the lawyer this week and I'm going to hear actually a little bit about that. I know we're going, we're going to turn now the conversations but um, there's a baseball stadium there for the Tulsa Drillers I think is the yeah. That's at the corner of Greenwood and Archer. And I'm like wow, in the shadow of the highway they ran through to destroy Black Wall Street the second time. And of course, shout out to Charlie Wilson them who says, this is not why we named the song. You dropped a bomb on me, but I'm not mad that people think it is because it does start the conversation. That's what Charlie Wilson said. That's the gap man from Tulsa. But Greenwood, Archer and Pine. Greenwood, Archer and Pine, which is where the thing set off. <laughs> That's right. You dropped a bomb on me. And they asked him, he said, man, look, did you write that because of 21? He said, no, but I'm not mad that y'all think I did. Because, because I'm from Tulsa. So what this children's book does is give you a timeline. But look, it don't start in 1921. It starts with the Trail of Tears because the story of Black Wall Street is the story of America. Settler colonialism, land dispossession, the Africans who can't end up out there, many of them got marched across from Florida and, 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 and Georgia, Louisiana. This is the work Holly Green is doing right now. And I won't talk more, more sure about it because we have this conversation in narrative. So, but know that you ended up in Tulsa because of land dispossession. So many all black towns, you end up like Renchersville where Buck Franklin was from. They end up in Tulsa, they build it, they destroy it. They build it back, they destroy it with the thing they use to destroy everywhere else, which is urban, so-called urban renewal. You 
you crater the property values, you redline, you don't give people loans. And then once it's depressed, you then come in, grab up the land and start redeveloping, which leads me to today. Hannibal Johnson tells all this story as well in this book, Black Wall Street 100, an American city grapples with historical racial trauma. And Johnson was on these commissions and all this kind of stuff. So today in Tulsa, our brother Roland Martin has been out there for the better part of last week uh, covering. And there's a real thing that's at the heart of this. And I started reading some of the cases. You got the Black Wall Street Legacy Festival going on. Dr. Crutcher, so many of the other people who are involved. Uh, what's the brother's name? Demario? Demario Solomon. Solomon Simmons. Demario Solomon Simmons. I, I, you know what? I, w I started looking up the cases. Uh, they just filed a case, in fact, which in many ways contributed to grinding to a halt what was supposed to go down this weekend and Monday, which we'll talk about in a second. And I'll tell you what I would do in, if we were physical. And I think we might actually, have, maybe we should do this in there too, Professor Hunter. But anyway, talk about this in a second. Um, I looked at a lawsuit he filed back in 2019. He filed a lawsuit that I began to read. Uh, actually, the lawsuit was, dis was, was decided in 2019. They sent it back to the lower court. He was one of the attorneys that sued the Cherokee Nation out there in Oklahoma. Uh, did y'all talk about that at all? Yeah, I mean, because Demario actually has roots. He he's uh, he has roots in, as a, he is part Cher Cherokee. Right. Uh, yeah. So. Okay. See, and, and see the cr the crazy thing about it is, and here's okay, and it would take Holly Greenman to walk you through this because he's been doing this stuff now for twenty some years. He and Shrikiana Greenman and their team, interviewing people to help us understand this. This fight in Native American communities in Oklahoma over black people who have Indian blood, so-called Indian blood, and therefore should be extended rights of Indians, that's not the fight. And I actually, because of Hiley, because, you know, I'm, I'm helping, I'm in, like, I'm in the corner taking notes as he's going through the footage and talking and I'm listening and taking notes. So then I go back and try to pull up documents to, you know, he's got every book on this been written. I'm like, man, the treaty, 1866, and then that's why, that's why this timeline in this children's book is so important. It walks you through it. The original treaties the federal government had with the Native Americans and the African people, the so-called freedmen, eventually, as they're called in Oklahoma, you don't need no Indian blood. You just need to have moved out there as a result of this forced migration. So the trick is stop trying to prove what percentage Indian you are. That has nothing to do with the legal question of the status as it was negotiated in the original treaties. That's important because if you, uh, there's a Supreme Court case that was just decided a few months ago. In fact, Neil Gorsuch wrote the opinion, which is interesting because on this issue, it was very interesting. They basically saying the Eastern third Oklahoma belonged to the Native Americans in the treaties. So now the black people who are supposed to be enrolled members of the Creek, really the Creek were the ones they kind of fought first. And then the Cherokee and others, the so-called five civilized tribes, whole conversation for another day, are like, yeah, our land too. And they like, yeah, what percentage blood? No, nah, don't be trying to trick us with that blood shit. We go back to the treaty, which was negotiated with us separately than Native Americans. See, that's the trick. Anyway, Brother bro, brother Simmons could help us walk through it. But anyway, he, he, I was reading one of the cases that was returned because they got to exhaust all the remedies with the Cherokee in the one particular. But he, in other words, he's been fighting this all the time. And he helped me, Professor Hunter, because see, I did not know his face and didn't know his name until you walked us through what I would normally, what I would do, which is I would go in a classroom, take Mother Viola Franklin's testimony before Congress last week. And we would use that as our text that day. And we would walk through that text applying our Africana studies framework. But I didn't know who the brother was turning pages for her. Yeah. That was him? That was Demario. Yeah. Wow. Okay, this is where we're going to end. I love it. I would take that text and we would go line by line through that text and apply our categories. So the social structure category, who is mother Viola uh, Fletcher? Who is she to other people? She says in that text, y'all done use my name to raise $30 million. Oop. <laughs> Oop. <laughs> There's something called Greenwood Rising. If you go online, look at this Tulsa2021.org. These are all the activities that are taking place really beginning Monday. They done some stuff before that, but beginning Monday and through the week. My man Cornell West gonna be out there, Hill Harper. They got a whole day of education. They got a national day of learning. They got a Greenwood Rising. They got a, 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 a center, a cultural center that they've developed, that kind of thing. But I'm listening to Roland interview the one city councilwoman, the counselor who's on there, Hall Harper, uh, Hall, uh, oh, uh, I had to think of her name. She saying, we're not in that. 
Why? Because that's the corporate sponsorship. That's the corporate funder. And Brother DeMario filed a lawsuit on behalf of Mother Fletcher, her brother, and the other survivors who is saying, who the last living three living survivors, saying, y'all owe us. And then they start. And then and now that side, which had the governor on there, because remember, they kicked the governor off because he signed this legislation, this anti-critical race theory legislation the last couple of weeks. And then they put him off. Senator James Lankford apparently has resigned from the commission. He says controversial, controversial. And Stacey Abrams was supposed to speak with this side of it. John Legend was supposed to sing. They pulled out in the last couple of days, in part because Dr. Crutcher and the survivors and Brother DeMario and them, like, we're not with them. They got that heritage thing. That's the black people. That's the black people who are saying, yeah, this is all cute, but how y'all patting yourselves on the back trying to congratulate yourself? Uh, Vanessa Hall Harper is the counselor out there who's talking about that. And how are you trying to congratulate yourself? Now, meanwhile, State Senator Kevin Matthews out there in Tulsa, you know, they raised thirty million dollars. They got this twenty million dollar Greenwood Rising Museum. You know, all this kind of stuff's going on. He said, "You know, we were trying to reach a settlement. We wanted to give some money to survivors, so we said we'd give you hundred thousand dollars a piece and put together two million dollars to seed money for reparations fund." And then he said, "But then y'all came back and said, no, nah, we want a million dollars a piece and fifty million dollars for the seed fund.'" And I guess did the brother Mario talk about that? Yeah, and he said that's a lie. They they're lying. Of course it is. Yeah. So and but let's say it wasn't a lie. What the hell is three million dollars? You lucky. See what they don't want to do is once you start giving, if you give them three money, then here comes everybody else who should every, everybody, everybody. <laughs> as they should. As, as they should. Should they? Should they, Professor Hunter? Yes. Well, shouldn't Elizabeth, they? Elizabeth Alexander said we gotta learn what our from our past. Okay. My man Clint Smith is saying there's a we. I'm saying there ain't no we, and the basis of a reparations claim. In a in contract law will be a contract, but here's the problem: because of the asymmetrical war, we weren't contracted labor. We are war victim. We are refugees, just like these. I mean, Mother Fletcher. When you read, there's a sentence in Mother Fletcher's testimony where she said, "Nevertheless, I put it aside and worked in the war effort in California." I would have my students say, "Pause." Why is why is Viola Fletcher in California in the 1940s? Because when she says later on, because I had to move from Tulsa, I only went to the fourth grade because she says, oh, I worked as a domestic most of my life. She said, I still can't meet my barely meet my basic needs. Y'all understand that the Tulsa diaspora, <laughs> you understand, like the Katrina diaspora, like the Mississippi diaspora in that children's book. The brother who bought the first lots that became Black Wall Street, that street, Greenwood, it run, he named it Greenwood because Greenwood's in Mississippi. That's where they came from. So he started, so I'm saying that diaspora, Mother Fletcher had to leave Tulsa. And guess what? How her people get to Tulsa? They was either marched over there through the trade of tea, trail of tears, or here's where it gets complicated. Y'all go to narrative and look at our conversation we had about Robert Church and Ida B. Wells and them and those black towns. And Booker Washington. Booker T. Washington one named it Black Wall Street. Why? Because it ain't just people who are maroons looking for a place to live. It's also black people trying to get rich. And some of them black people ran out there to buy land to sell it to other black people. And they didn't have the purest of motives. In other words, the black community is as complicated as any other community. But when we reinforce in these uh in these social structure magazines and stuff, the idea that you gotta be prosperous to be human. Then when you start telling that story and then you come down to a reparations argument, it's three old people that's saying, that's a lie, but I don't give a damn. Break them off at a million apiece. No, hold on, Negroes. We got your man coming in on the corporate side to sing one day when the glory comes. <laughs> yeah. And then he found out that the black people wasn't in it. He was like, hold on. Wait a minute. We got this sister who rescued us for a minute until the Senate decided they're going to go white nationalists who flipped Georgia and she going to come give a speech with the elder sitting there. But now she found out the elder not coming because y'all full of shit. And she said, hold up. Wait a minute. There is no we. Stop saying there's a we because what y'all want to commemorate is how great you are. How forget you. And then you want us to continue to beg for our humanity while you done ran a highway through the community, while you done redlined the people. We disperse the people where right today in Tulsa, 
Unemployment in the black community is twice the rate of white people, just like everywhere else. The median income of black people is half what it is for white people. Students in Tulsa schools are nine times as likely if they're black to be suspended. The life expectancy in Tulsa among black people is 11 years less. It is, In other words, you know what Tulsa is? Tulsa is the criminal enterprise called the United States of America in microcosm. And no amount of paying for people to come in and reflect and consider and remember and pledge to do better is going to wash the stink of the fact that there is no we. If there's going to be a we, if you're going to talk about reparations, you know, the first thing that must precede reparations is an acknowledgement of our humanity, which then moves us from the category of enslaved object to the category of human work, labor, and then reconstructs the relationship. But there are no reparations due to slaves. Unless, see, reparations ain't got nothing to do with us. Who are you? There's no we. You know how you know ain't no, ain't no, ain't no we? Because you don't have to ask reparations of we. <laughs> yeah, they have they have black people out here in this country trying to uh give reparations to ourselves. <laughs> like, what what y'all better stop running out in traffic. <laughs> running out of intellectual traffic, getting hit by all the cars and pause. Get off that highway. Anyway, let's, let's pause there for a Oh me. my God. Um, <laughs> thank you. No. As, as all, and you know, the reframing and the remembering and all that is so important, you know, and we have to do some deep thinking. Yes. We, you know, it's, we're in a knee jerk, you know, microwave sound bite society right now. And as you right. said, even our books are distilled into these little sound bites that we all regurgitate back to one another. That's right. Without any serious thoughts. So I just appreciate you immensely. All right, we're going to re, re, uh, reintroduce the question, the Q&A portion of In Class today. Yes. Yes, yes. and these uh, are some beautiful people. We got some beautiful people. Can I just say how beautiful our class is, our, our people, our yes. folks? Yes. All right, let's yes. bring in. Yes, yes, yes. yes. James, who is in Miami. Yes. Um, you just meet yourself, brother. Welcome. Oh. Well, greetings, Professor Hunter, Dr. Cobb. I want to thank you again for the opportunity to learn yet again this new and original ways of thinking. Uh, I had a two-part question, but you kind of answered my B question just a minute ago, Dr. Cobb. We on that vibration. Hey, uh, my question first would be, what ways and practices of remembering our story not only pay homage, but also inspire our actions for celebrating our holy days? in terms of just like you said, Memorial Day. Can I ask you something, Brother James? You born and raised in Miami? I am born and raised in Miami, one of those red people. Uh, you know what? In that case, then, I will say something. Give me 10 seconds, and I want to throw it back to you. How uh, I think what we have to do is remember how our people, wherever we are, did it, and then connect the ways we did it locally to the places we do everywhere else, which leads me to the question I want to ask you. You a brother from Miami, so that means I ain't got to tell you nothing about North Miami. I ain't got to tell you about Liberty City. I ain't got to tell you about what they did down there. Could you help the rest of us understand how do y'all remember? What are some of the rituals of remembrance y'all do? And what kind of ways, that when you hear T Tulsa, you say, well, shit, that's Miami. Help us. Well, the as they used to call Overtown, they used to call it the Harlem of the South, the old Tulsa. And even Coconut Grove, we also have to give pay homage to our Bahamian brothers and sisters, as well as the 162 African black men that voted to make the city of Miami a actual city in 1896. So a third of the signers of the city charter were black men. So uh, what they've done down here in the city of Miami is we used to have Goombe, used to be on June 6th. We, that was a celebration where we used to get our junk and new on. Right Junkin down, oh, whoa, come on, brother. Right down in Coconut Grove, where you literally had the track or what they call the Metro Rail now, where you had Coral Gables and the Miracle Mile, million dollar homes, and then you had uh the other side of the track where you had the, the shotgun shanties and shacks, old old Florida Pine, and it literally cut off the street, Grand Avenue. You could go from the Ritz Carlton Hotel into poverty on the same street i've written i've written i've written that rail in fact we had the uh, national conference of uh, the national coalition of blacks for reparations in america down there general rashid from the republican that's, new that's, africa that's my general 
You so you know Jerry Rashid, no question, bro. That's what I'm saying. So let's so help us, James, in terms of this. You already know the answer. You really wouldn't even question. I'm glad you're raising this because how do you all continue in these rituals? Do y'all continue some of these rituals of memory keeping in Miami? No matter how small. Yes, we do. And actually, it's or believe it or not, it's more on a secular level, I would say now, ways of knowing that we don't even know that we know. A lot of mm -hmm. our local DJs and parties <laughs> when we used to have the street street events, when you hear the whistle, you know what time it is. The Goombe Jump the New Song will be played at every street event and uh, even at my aunt's home going and yes. as well as her uh, 96th birthday party. We had the Junkin' New Band in the street and had it come in and just the, just the, just the drums, the sounds, the whistles, and the clamoring. And our Cuban brothers and sisters, when they celebrate, we, get, we, go, we all going out with pots and pans every time the heat went. See, see, this is, you know, it's so funny, uh, Baba, when you, when you talk about that, uh, Baba James. We know that we are Africans. In the social structure, they try to divide us. Blacks and Latinos, Blacks. But what, as you're describing, we come out of that same root. So he started talking about Junkin' New Man. I'm thinking about, for example, the Pinkster Committee in New York. We had the Deep Career. They are the ones who spearhead uh, Decoration Day in New York. But it's coming out of that same notion of ancestors and celebration. And so when you, when you evoke the use of the whistles and then transcendent English and Spanish, you're talking... Think about New Orleans, Mobile, thinking about all those different places where those rituals continue. And in fact, that's one of the mentions, and I just mentioned this right quick, uh, uh, Professor Hunter, as James has kind of led to him, reminded me, those Caribbean origin rituals. And we got a couple of weeks before we get to Juneteenth, and we talked about Juneteenth last year. Uh, so this, this, this stuff on narrative of on it, but this gives us another chance. In fact, a better chance to talk about it in a couple of weeks. A lot of the rituals, for example, among free Africans in the United States in the North, after um, the Civil War, they rejected July 4th as Independence Day in favor of January the 1st, which we've talked about before. But in New York, this has a South Carolina tie. That same Charleston, South Carolina, was the home for a couple of years of a brother who ended up being the first black faculty member at the University of South Carolina, who was also the dean of the Howard University School of Law whose daughter, after they got, she, he, and her, he and her mother got divorced, changed her name to Greener and became the major librarian of the J.P. Morgan Library. We talked about that when we talked about Dorothy Porter Wesley. For those of you who missed that, that's, that's back last year. This brother, Richard Greener, left South Carolina. He was in New York for a while. And you know the, the joke there, all the New Yorkers say, who's buried in Grant's tomb? Grant and his wife, I've been there many times, talking to the park rangers, black park rangers there listening to them, having conversations with them about the fact that it was black people led by Richard Greener, who was the head of the, uh, the committee, combined with others who raised the money for Grant's tomb in part because they created this idea that we will celebrate Grant because Grant was one of the people that helped us in our liberation struggle. But it all that all comes back to Memorial Day as well. So James, and the reason I mentioned that is because in 2021, we think about the pinkster if you know what Pinkster is, another one of those celebrations with roots in the Caribbean, like Junkanoo, you heard James talk about Junkanoo. You can't think of Memorial Day. You can't think of Juneteenth. You can't think of any of our celebrations in this country as African people as exclusively anchored to the social structure. That's how you end up with articles talking about we. But what James just told you is Miami is as much or more a part of the Caribbean and Latin America, including Africana, as it is any a part of the other 49 states. James had to run. He was a firefighter. He had to go to work. Really? And, yeah. So he, he jumped off. He was staying. He was holding on to ask his question. And he said, I might get a call. You heard the phone ring. So uh, God he, bless James and protect fire department never sleeps. So I appreciate him. his service. God bless him. God uh, bless him. You ready for Alicia? Dr. Alicia, who is in Houston, Texas. Houston! Welcome. What's going on? How are you, Dr. Hey. Carr? How are you? It's good to see you. I'm great. I'm in Houston today, as you can see. But yeah. uh, With my sister and, and mama and brother-in-law and niece and Ron Martin's people, you down there in the belly. I the am. Belly. I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm still working in D.C., Mississippi. I'm all over the place. But That's hey. what I'm saying. Worldwide. Worldwide. What's going on, Doc? 
Hey, hey, I appreciate this opportunity. No. Thank you for answering my question about redistricting while um, telling us the story about Tulsa and so forth. I'll be real quick and brief. Um, I know that you unpacked a little bit about Charles Drew and, and President Wayne Frederick and the Freedmen um, Hospital and so forth. Um, you know, I'm a woman of action. How can we put some more action behind what you share today and as, we're, as it relates how we see ourselves and how we value ourselves enough to help other blacks that are living with sickle cell. And you know, we already have over a hundred thousand blacks in this country alone dealing with this inherited uh, disease. W what can we do? I, I mean, our, our what do you, I mean, you well, know? Let me let me just say something right quick and then throw it back to you because you know this is an area you know you you can really help us and this is an opportunity for some people who may not know some very specific things, including people who may suffer from sickle cell or or have to have the the the, the trait. I won't say suffer because the suffering is part of it, but um, I think a great deal of this has to do with awareness of those of our people, particularly educated. Oh, you got the global majority. I see you rocking it, you Yes. <laughs> Out here, out. You see, she got to do that though. You got to do that. You got to majority. Don't, don't let anyone forget. Rock it. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. No, but, and as Dr. Frederick talks about a lot at Howard, I mean, you know, he himself having inherited yes. the trait, he has to be very careful of how he moves through the world. And of course, he's been, he's been incredibly productive. But for and for a lot of people who don't have the resources, who don't have the support, um, they really and we really have to rely on those of you who can really help with very practical ways of moving through the world so that you don't end up in a moment of crisis and whether it relate to stress or diet or you know uh, the the surrounding factors that can that can impact sickle cell and understanding finally that you know this trait and this is where i think about my friend uh, fatima jackson who's a biological anthropologist a uh, very brilliant sister who helps our young people understand the genetic roots of these traits. So these aren't flaws in our biology. These are ways that the human instrument adapted to our circumstances. But then you take us and throw us into another mm -hmm. area and then pile us with bad diet, too much salt, too much, and it triggers these things. Because could you help us understand like some very practical things for somebody who's listening and saying, oh, salt, what they got to do? Well, I have the traits, so that means I have to suffer. No, what can, what can we do? What can we well, do? We can ultimately adjust our lifestyles um, mm -hmm. in, in order to um, av avoid this. And do you remember back in y'all's day, not my day, I used, to, <laughs> I used to listen to the elders speak, getting blood tests before you got married. It was a reason for that, because this is a genetic um, um, disease. It's passed on to and it impacts chromosome 11 specifically. And they test to see, does your mom have the tray or your dad has a plate? And then, you know, our red blood cells are like a little donut that flows through our body. But with sickle cells, it's like a sickle, an icicle sickle, God, you know. So with that, if, um, you know, with that tray, one in 13, just a, a fact, one in 13 African-American babies are born with this rare, um, you know, trait. And of that, uh, one in 360, um, 365 black kids are, are born with sickle cell. But we, the people that don't have sickle cell, it's something we can do. We can donate blood, something as simple as that. We can help our brothers. We can be our brothers and sisters keepers. How oh, many of you that are listening today are blood donors? Let's keep it real. Mm -hmm. And we do have more blacks um, in research and researchers, as well as the modern day Charles Drew at the Red Cross. And what they're encouraging us to do, starting on June the 3rd, which is Charles Drew, through Drew Day, through June 19th, which is Juneteenth, to partner with 16 HBCUs and be a part of that action. Just, just give. It's wow. easy to give. Now, look, I sacrifice my own self. The sight of blood in my own makes me sick. But it's bigger than me. I have no positive blood. So number one, while you're giving blood, you'll understand your blood type and you're helping other individuals such as, you know, President Wayne Frederick um, at, at Howard University and so forth. But again, it's important for us to get genetic testing before we unite in order to, you know, avoid some of these, you know, genetic challenges. How do you okay, so how do we get it? Where do we go? So the 16 partnering or HBCUs, how do we get more information about that? Well, you can simply go to the uh, 16 Days to Celebrate the Legacy website. It's a um, it's a, a website. Actually, you can 
what's the website? You can go to rbblood.org forward slash 16 days. It'll uh, highlight all 16 HBCUs is directly linked to the Red Cross. It's the 16 days to celebrate. Not only you celebrate Dr. Charles Drew through us uh, all the way through Juneteenth Day, which happens to be Global Sickle Cell Awareness Day. We oh, spoke yeah. about global uh, majority. This is a global um, ge uh, genetic disease that affects blacks. No question. <laughs> No question. But no that question. was my question. How how can we, you know, help? Well, you, just, you just gave us a very no. I, maybe I, gotta, I gotta jump in and thank you, Alicia. And I just want to say, um, I had no idea that Charles Drew's birthday was June June third. I had no idea that Alicia was gonna come in and ask this question. Wait a minute now. I Let's, promise you, I'm like sitting here right now. I promise you, I had no clue. Well, Charles Drew knew. Charles, see, y'all y'all understand how the ancestors work. I know people be like getting in my, I have my mind blown every time you and I have a conversation. You don't even understand. I had no idea. I just Google searched. I'm like, that was his birthday on June 3rd? I had no idea. And you ain't know I was going to talk about it because I ain't know I was going to talk about I it. No idea. I'm leaning back, seeing if I can find one blood, but it ain't over in that stack. I was, I, was there, like, I, mean, I was like, you know, I was having this conversation because people are always anxious about learning. I remember the time and I shared the story today without knowing that Alicia was going to come in and do what she did, not knowing that Charles Drew's birthday is June 3rd. Didn't even Charlie know. Drew. That was Charlie <laughs> Drew in the South of Fall. They whispered in the ear and said, listen, let's Don't forget time. me. Don't forget, which is not only that. I, this is what I need you to do next week. <laughs> Woo! And to answer Alicia's fundamental question, we started last week, which we wanted to do a narrative and then ran into some technical difficulties, which is, is also a reminder that we need more black coders. We need more black mm -hmm. folk tech that will build out the things we need. If Zuckerberg could put a whole team together to put that sorry ass Facebook out, which we all have made him into a very, very rich person. With our ingenuity and our goodness, um, we can do that for one another, and I think we must. Yes, we should not have to rely on anybody else's platform, we should have yeah. our own. That said, last week was for me the foundational um layer that conversation we had with Dr. Senyata, mm -hmm. the legacy of W.E.B. Du Bois, and then I had a conversation this week with Dr. Almalara, who's in uh Queens, doing that work, you know, in terms of building these, these key, uh, these um pop-ups, I'll call them, these these little spaces in our community of, of well, wellness and health. Mm. And, and she does it in Queens, New York. And we're, we're talking this week about where else we can do it next. But people who have sickle cell, high, di you know, high blood pressure, diabetes in their community should be serviced. And we need to build the apparatus for them to be served. And so the work that Dr. Alicia is talking about, yes, we will be doing that. Narrative is a working space. It's not okay. the classroom where we're sitting there, you know, jamming you with information, but you will be called to do something. You're going to be required to, you know, start growing some stuff, your own food. You're going to be required to, to see wh where you can fit in. Everybody has a skill. Everybody's bringing spice and something to the table. Right. There. Thank you, Dr. Alicia, for that. Um, and I'm kind of shaking. I'm shook right now, I'll be honest with you, because I'm like, I can't. I, are, you just, are you kidding me? It's a vibration. It's a shaking of vibration. And and in fact, I'm glad as, as you were talking and, you know, it it jogged my memory. We're, my man, Will, 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 Will Jenkins, Wilbert Jenkins, his book's called Seizing the New Day. That's what we're doing. That's what those Africans who dug up those people who were given their lives and reburied them and paid respect. They said, we're seizing the new day. We're not going to forget what you did, and we're going to use that and remind ourselves of who we are. So narrative, uh, as you say, it's a working space. We all have something we bring. And if you don't think you have something to bring, reflect on the fact this Memorial Day weekend. Reflect on the fact that a woman and a man had a, had a child who they loved and gave him everything he could get, and he turned into Charles Drew. Reflect on the fact that these Africans who came out of enslavement never forgot their culture. They remixed it. And so the reason they went out there and reburied those human beings was not because of anything they learned in America. It's because they understood respect for their ancestors from when their ancestors were brought from Africa. And they never and that memory was passed on down through the years. And remember a narrative that if you are human in the world, which means yes, that's everybody, you have 
skills and talents and gifts and self to give. So thank you for everyone who is donating scholarships for folks who can't afford to be over there. Uh, thank you for everyone who's in these conversations going on because uh, we need everybody, everybody. Thank you for understanding that it isn't black and white. It may sound like it, but what's going on this weekend in Tulsa is very clear evidence of the fact that wherever you are, you can play a role. Everybody on the Tulsa Commission is not against black people. Everybody in the festival side is not, it's not that clear and complicated. In fact, O.W. Gurley, and we know that name from Tulsa, right? O.W. Gurley, who was a brother who, oh my goodness. Oh yeah, here's the children's book. I'll use the children's book. I won't go to the other ones. O.W. Gurley, because it's got great pictures in it, right? O.W. Gurley came in, that's the brother who named it Greenwood when they discovered oil in Tulsa in 1905. He had come from Mississippi. And they built the grocery stores. He's got the first lots going on. They start building out of brick because brick was cheaper. And they had black communities, for black black businesses that did bricks. Uh, the street, Greenwood, one of the few streets didn't cross through both black and white neighborhoods. That's how they could build it. And he founded Mount Vernon AME Church. Mount Vernon Church is where these uh, where they're supposed to have one of these major rituals this weekend. But of course, at the center, that is interesting because uh, Roland, Roland Martin was talking to Carlton Pearson, Bishop Pearson, who I know primarily through the music. But Carlton Pearson was talking about how it's complicated because at the center of what's going on in Tulsa is clashing memories. So you have to understand what we're doing in narrative is a conversation with and work with people who bring their individual skills and abilities and self to a conversation, it doesn't make us all the same. We want that diversity. But what diversity can't do is harden into what some some of what we're seeing playing out in Tulsa. And I read H House Bill 1775. That's that anti-critical race theory bill that the governor signed into law a few days ago. It's in sec section 24-157 of Title 70 of the U of the Oklahoma uh, state law now. And my thing is all this anti-critical race theory uh, legislation they're passing. I'm saying, hey, let's roll with it. <laughs> let's roll with it. Why? Because it says that part of the bill, I read the bill, part of the law now says you cannot require diversity training. You cannot, uh, you cannot stereotype race. You can't have people feel like they're superior. I said, okay. So I said, okay, so this is what happened. You can't teach. Hold on. Your law says we cannot teach that people are superior. Are you saying white people are superior, Congressman, uh, Senator, Governor? Are you saying that white? Say it out your mouth with your little bird chest. Are you saying white people are superior? Because if so, I'm going to read your statute against you. See, John Henry Clark said, "Don't get mad, get smart." In other words, we want to destroy all this legislation, but until we can do that, register to vote, run for office, protest, organize, until we can do that. You take it because ask yourself, is it worse for us now in the courts than it was for Charles Hampton Houston, a colleague, faculty colleague of Charlie Drew at Howard University, who also went to Dunbar High School? Is it worse for us than it was for them? No. Stop selling yourself short. Was it was it look? Oh, wait, I should show you this one though. I love this picture, uh, Professor Hunter. I love this is from Carlos Hill's book. If I can find it quickly, if I can't, I won't be able to do it. Let me see if I can find it fast. If I can't. I won't be able to, you know what? Let me look over here because they used it in the National Geographic joint. Which I thought was, I mean, which I'm just like, look, I love the pictures. National Geographic, look, they're going to bring Newsom. Remember Reverend E.X. Slade? There's a reason there was a fence around that flag in the first place. I'm saying that's a relay. She took the baton from Reverend, oh, here we go. Here's Buck Franklin and his law partner, I.H. Spears. Just after they burnt down Tulsa, them Negroes went and got a tent. <laughs> and they started practicing law because they started soon. Because the reason they could build back better, not better, bigger. Because see, just because they built back bigger don't mean the people they burnt out came back. Because remember, the Fletcher and them ended up all the way out in California. That's how she ended up in the war effort. So, but uh, I let let me name her as well. The sister in the middle, who's doing all the the typing and the writing there. That's uh, Effie Thompson. So it isn't just Spears Franklin, it's Spears Franklin Thompson. Look, look, these Negroes, I'm looking at this picture like they don't burn up everything in Greenwood. Where the hell y'all get these law books? <laughs> they in a tent. And you see what's at their feet? That's not wood, that's brick. Why? Because they had brick factory there too. Let me tell y'all something. Y'all can't kill black people. 
You don't, Dr. Crutcher, Tiffany Crutcher, whose brother, twin brother Terrence, was murdered by the Tulsa police. She's out there in the street today. And so what can we do? Well, we can surround her with our work, with our efforts. We, we That's how we're going to win. The spirit, in other words, I don't even call it Black Wall Street. I got my own, you know, we talked about Book T. Washington another day. Yeah, he's just a complicated figure. <laughs> Let's just think about it in terms of. What do you, what do you call it, Dr. Carr? Self-determination. It's maroonage. See, these black people were just trying to live. And in American history for African people, at the core of our governance structure is leave us alone. Just leave us alone. In other words, I'm not I'm not trying to hate you. It's bad enough. I mean, no. Can I just let me build? So even when we make a reparations demand, even a reparations demand is less about it's less about expecting it and more about saying, no, you owe me whether I ever get paid. Well, if we ever get the resources, now you go on and do what you do. Your people tried to tear up your whole damn capital. By the way, if we was being technical about it, you know, we built that thing. So <laughs> they in there trying to tear down something we built under duress. At the same time, however, the fact that you won't stop them tells us everything we need to know about you everything we need to know about you. And this ain't Democrat versus Republican. I mean, they say, oh, this isn't Democrat, Republican. It's about us and, and whether we're American. No, 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 no. I'm sorry, Speaker Pelosi. I'm sorry, Senator Schumer. When you say we're better than this, you realize that we all know that's a lie. That's not, that's not even a matter of opinion, brother. That's a matter of historical memory. These white boys are trying to erase and they're not even trying to race after 100 years. This happened in January. Don't talk about it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, I, I would say Wall Street is great branding because we think about capitalism. But let's just think about self-determination. You don't have to own a business to be great, but you can support a business that then supports you. And we achieve greatness together. The greatness wasn't in the fact that they own businesses. The greatness was in the fact that they built institutions that nurtured a community. Because most people didn't own a business in Tulsa. Mother Fletcher people didn't own no business. But guess what? Mother Fletcher lived in that community. And those black schools that trained her. And, Dr. and Professor Hunter, we talked about this. And we talked about that on the narrative side. But I want y'all ask. Just ask yourself this question. And we'll answer it on the narrative side. How somebody who got burnt out of her home city and moved halfway across the continent who wasn't able to finish any but the fourth grade who worked for her most of her life as a domestic who's still struggling to get by her bills, not miss a word, reading a prepared testimony page by page in front of senators, including some like Jim Jordan, who I'm not convinced can't read the language of his own ancestors. <laughs> and she only went to the fourth grade. What kind of school was that? Come over to the narrative side. We'll talk about that. She's 107. 107 and going strong and like, oh no, I'm not coming to that ball stadium. Stacy, baby, I don't think you know. They didn't give me no money. She said that in the testimony. She said, y'all using my name. <laughs> yes. Mother Fletcher said, hold up. As a, uh, as a, uh, as a, uh, was it a, uh, 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 Yasin Bey in, in that remix of uh, Kanye and them? <laughs> Two words, F you pay me. Mother Fletcher. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Ooh, can we use Mother Fletcher? Mm, I just had an idea. All right, we'll talk about this off mic. Let me okay. say thank you to everyone. Thank you, Dr. Alicia. Of course, uh, everyone that is in narrative in the largest. Uh, thank you for that. Everyone who's donated. Thank you. Thank yes. you. Thank, thank you. you. Everyone around the globe, the largest Africana studies classroom in the world. Appreciate really? you. And Dr. Carr, I love you. I love you, you. Much. Professor Hunter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you on Wednesday is when we do our other work. Wednesday, yes. Yeah, y'all get all better sign up because this thing on John Brown is so lit. I can't tell y'all. We no. had to tie it up in two parts. John Brown is, look, yeah. Y'all want to be an ally? Look that Say up. That. <laughs> right. See that. you next week, everyone. Love you.